Well, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from um, from uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, my name is Erica Di Ruggiero, and I am the director of the Center for Global Health at the Dalana School of Public Health. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on implementation research to achieve health risk related uh, sustainable development goals in low middle income countries. I'm delighted to mention that this webinar is co-hosted by the Interdisciplinary Cluster on Implementation and Improvement Science, Support Public Health and Health Systems Globally, um, and something I co-chair with um, Dr. Shaolin Wei, who's also joining. Uh, the University of Ottawa School of Epidemiology and Public Health, we'll hear from Melissa in a moment, and the Bruyere Research Institute for, and its Center for Equity and Effectiveness. Um, this webinar is actually linked to the release of seven approaches to investing in implementation research in LMICs. Uh, this is a new good practice document by the Essence on Health Research Initiative led by the Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Disease, also known as TBR based at the World Health Organization. And we'll hear from one of uh, their representatives, Dr. Gary Aslanian in a moment. And this um, Essence Initiative brings together over 40 funding agencies from around the world. So just briefly, um, we're going to start the webinar with some opening remarks um, and I'll introduce our two um, speakers in a moment. It will be followed by two presentations the first one really introducing us to implementation science and some of the unique challenges and opportunities that exist for taking approaches to implementation. And then the second presentation will focus on the Essence document. Uh, you should have all received a link to that document when you registered. The presentations then will be followed by some commentary from funders um, and their focus on improving health and health systems, particularly in low and middle income countries. Uh, funders will actually reflect on how they increasingly use innovative frameworks and methodologies that underpin implementation research with the focus on trying to bridge that knowing and doing gap through collaboration with researchers, policymakers, and health practitioners. And we'll end the session with an interactive Q&A session. So we really encourage you to start thinking about your questions as they occur to you. We'll try to address as many of those questions as possible. Please direct any questions you'd like to have answered in the Q&A function that you find on this webinar. Uh, and you'll also direct any questions you have after this uh, webinar to the email address, which we'll post. So um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Browers. She's the director of the University of Toronto School of Epidemiology and Public Health. She'll offer some opening remarks and then turn things over to Dr. Stanley Brown, who is the Dean of the Dalana School of Public Health. I'll invite the two of them to give their remarks and then I'll introduce our panelists in a moment. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you, Erica. And it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here as part of uh, this wonderful event. So welcome everybody. Um, as Erica mentioned, my name is Melissa Browers and I'm from the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. And, and before we begin, I'd just like to recognize that we're beaming from all across the country and from other countries too. But um, to begin this event, for those of you who are in this country, I'd just like to acknowledge that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples from the beginning. And as settlers, we're very grateful for the opportunity to meet here wherever you are. Um, I think we may have something's happening with Melissa's connection. I guess uh, this is the wonderful world of Zoom. Uh, perhaps I can um, ask Danny, you can step in and uh, we'll hear from her later. Thank you. Right. So just to uh, just to uh, finish off the land acknowledgement, which is where uh, she froze. I just to say we're grateful to be meeting on this land and uh, I hope that uh, we'll have a, a very productive meeting today. Uh, look, as well, before I go on, I just want to acknowledge that today is International uh, Women and Girls in Science Day, and that includes implementation science, and I'm really grateful for the expertise and the insight that uh, we have coming to us today here, and actually we've got a variety of different duties around implementation science today, uh, but coming from uh, women scientists across the province and across the country. Uh, look, let me, let me just make a couple of three quick points right up front. 
Um, the first is it's really hard to imagine a school of public health, uh, wherever it is, that is not focused critically on the issues of global health and particularly the sustainable development goals. And it would be unwise for any school to consider the importance of that without realizing, recognizing how valuable implementation science can be. Uh, I know that uh, Melissa would probably say the same thing about uh, what's happening in Ottawa, but you know, for us at the school, at the Dalana School right now, uh, this webinar aligns very tightly uh, with our academic plan, our, our strategy as a school, particularly with our section on global health, but uh, I believe that this is one of the areas where they can be learning from uh, all across the school and work uh, collaboratively all across the school. Um, you know, I think the other thing that's important when we think about this is that public health itself is inherently an applied discipline. Uh, you know, what makes it exciting, what makes it meaningful, uh, but what brings its complexity uh, is that it's an applied discipline. And the same is true of implementation science. And so the two come together very, very well uh, when we think about uh, topics like global health, because it forces us to look at context. It forces us to look at uh, a variety of other issues. And uh, you know, at our school, we've got uh, a cluster working on this, led by uh, Dr. Shaolin Wei and Dr. Erica DiRuggiero. And uh, its goal is to catalyze high quality interdisciplinary research and implementation science, which I hope will be uh, pretty helpful uh, to the broader goal. Uh, develop and pilot some educational activities that we can build and strengthen implementation science. Sort it's a good example of that. Uh, WHO TDR is another good example of that. Uh, and to build a community of practice on implementation science involves faculty and trainees, but I hope it goes well beyond the school uh, to capture a lot of the great work that goes on in Toronto, but also a lot of the great work that goes on across Ontario and across, uh, across Canada. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Melissa in a second because I see we've got her back, uh, but I'll just close it saying, you know, for us, and I know this is true for uh, hopefully all the participants uh, on the call, this is just the start of a conversation. Uh, for us, we're hoping this is going to continue to include global institutions and funders and researchers and trainees uh, around the world. And I'm looking for more opportunity for cla engagement and collaboration. And Melissa, now that you're back, I'll just say it's a pleasure to share the uh, welcome with you today. So thanks for doing that with us. Thanks for stepping in, Stanie. The joy of the Zoom event. <laughs> I lost internet for about 30 seconds. So let me try again. Uh, I was in the midst of the land acknowledgement and it is important. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to uh, try again and then I'll just say a couple other remarks. Um, uh, I'll start sort of midway. I just wanna recognize because we're all over Canada um, that there are generations of indigenous people who've, who have taken care of this land for thousands and thousands of years. And long before today, as we gather here, there have been Indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. And as I mentioned, as a member of the University of Ottawa community, I'd like to sp spend special respects or pay special respects, pardon me, to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of our land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship of this territory, which remains unceded. And we pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who do call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honour their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. And like Staney, uh, implementation science is near and dear to my heart. I'm thrilled to be able to uh, be part of this uh, audience to listen to these wonderful speakers and the panelists who've been set up. I'd also like to acknowledge that it is a wonderful opportunity that we see to be able to collaborate with our friends and colleagues from the Barrier Research Institute, from uh, the Dalalana School of Epidemiology or of Public Health in Toronto, and the School of Epidemiology and Public Health. Um, and together, I'm hoping that we can be able to do these things more frequently. Um, I would like to turn it back over to Erica. Enjoy the session. It's going to be a stellar event. And I really look forward to uh, being able to continue this uh, dialogue and discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Melissa, for bouncing back so effortlessly and uh, to Staney for your remarks as well. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speakers and then I'll turn to them um, each. Um, so very briefly, Dr. Allison Prentel is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto's School of Epidemiology and Public Health and also a scientist at the Gruyere Research Institute. She's going to kick us off and she'll be followed by Dr. Gary Aslanian, who's an adjunct professor at the Dalana School of Public Health and also at the University of Ottawa School of Epidemiology and Public Health. 
He is uh, the Manager of Partnerships and Governance for the Special Program for Research and Training in Tropical Diseases, TDR, at the World Health Organization. They will be followed by a panel of funders, uh, Dr. Montessor Kamal, um, who's the Program Leader in Maternal and Child Health at the International Development Research Center. A special congratulations to IDRC, um, who launched their 10-year um, agenda yesterday. Um, so I'd invite you to check that out. Um, he'll be followed by Jennifer Gunning, who is the Manager of International Relations and Executive Support at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And finally, Dr. Rachel Stirk is the Deputy Division Director and Senior Scientist at the Center for Global Health Studies, Fogarty International Center at the National Institutes of Health. And then we'll have time for questions. So I'll turn things over to you, Allison, to kick us off. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Erica. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and uh, I've been an implementation researcher myself for the better part of the last 10 years um, and have worked very closely with WHO TDR. Uh, in their uh, toolkit uh, for implementation research. So um, I'm challenged actually to do this in about 10 minutes <laughs> because I have a lot to say on this. Uh, so my, uh, the title of my talk is Implementation Research Key to Reaching uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. So what I'd like to do in the, in the next little bit of time is to, to really take a 30,000 foot view of implementation research. And for many of you on the webinar, this is probably something you're very familiar with. And for others, it may be an introduction. I'd also like to talk about why it's particularly important in 2021 as we're approaching this final decade uh, on the road to the SDGs. I'll share with you um, how we can use IR through a case study and our experience in uh, Indonesia. And then finally, just some comments about why IR is different than other lines of scientific inquiry. So what is implementation research? And uh, you've heard the term also implementation science. So there are, there are many defini definitions of IR uh, and some interchangeability with implementation science. Um, but the definition that I have shown here uh, is coming directly from the essence document. Uh, but I'd like to call your attention to um, this figure here on the left. Uh, these are five key characteristics of implementation research that I'd just like to highlight for you today. The first one is it's a systematic approach. So uh, it's a systematic approach to understand and address barriers to effective and quality uh, implementation of health interventions, strategies, or policies. Um, and it begins, it's demand driven. So it begins with a research question that is framed on the needs that have been identified with stakeholders uh, and implementers who are working within the health system. The second component is that the team itself is multidisciplinary and I'll, I'll deal with that a little bit more uh, in the case study and you'll see the group of indivi individuals that made up our team. The third key characteristic of IR is its view of context and the importance of understanding context in, in uh, an IR project. And by context, I mean the political, the environment, maybe the physical terrain of where the intervention is taking place, stakeholders, cultural uh, uh, context or socioeconomic, among others. The fourth is the complexity of IR. IR is dynamic and adaptive. And because it's, it's studying a, a strategy or a policy or an, or an intervention that's already in place, the pieces are moving all the time. And one of the components that I'll talk about later is this idea of continuous monitoring and feeding back into the system the results of the research so that course corrections can be made uh, to the intervention or the strategy. Finally, IR is, happens in real life. So it makes it different uh, than some much more controlled research uh, studies that you might see where you can actually control the variables. In IR, there's a lot that you can't control because uh, real life is not as neat uh, as we'd like it to be sometimes. So why is IR so important to achieve the SDGs? Well, I've put here four um, infectious and communicable diseases or disease groups. Um, uh, that continue to cause a significant burden of disease in the world today. 
And for each of them, we do have efficacious tools to prevent or treat um, these conditions. And yet uh, in 2019, the WHO reported uh, 229 million new infections for malaria and over 400,000 deaths. If we look at neglected tropical diseases, which we'll be discussing today um, in a little bit more detail, they affect 1.7 billion people around the world. Um, and yet for many of these diseases, we actually even have free treatments that are available to prevent uh, these conditions. And yet one in five people remain affected by NTDs. For COVID-19, we finally understand uh, the best way to, to prevent infections. And yet yesterday alone, the WHO reported uh, over 334,000 new cases. So for each of these, uh, in diseases and for and for other uh, health uh, programs, we actually have efficacious tools, tools that have been shown to work. And yet when we introduce them into the community or the health system, they're not as effective. And, and as we look at this particular figure here, we can see that it might be an issue of access, uh, accessibility. Do people have access to a bed net or a mask? Uh, it may be due to provider compliance. Uh, do the health workers, uh, the community volunteers adhere to the guidelines on the use uh, of a treatment uh, or, or a certain um, product? Do individual patients or individuals in the community actually adhere uh, to the way that that tool is supposed to be used? And I think all of us can conjure up in our minds an image of people who wear their masks below their nose, for example, um, or uh, bed nets uh, that haven't been tucked under the mattress. And so IR actually strives to understand at each of these different places, what are the bottlenecks or barriers um, to uh, making uh, um, the use of an efficacious tool um, and, and the loss of effectiveness. So I'd like to bring a case study uh, up for you today for us to talk about. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about lymphatic filariasis, which might be a new concept to some of the people on this call today. Um, and I'm just gonna very, very quickly tell you what LF is. Uh, it is a mosquito-borne infection um, uh, that affects over 800 million people in the world. It is slated for elimination as a public health problem. Um, and we do that through the Mass Drug Administration uh, to 65% of all eligible people living in an endemic area. And they have to take drugs every year, uh, once a year for four to six years. So it's quite a logistical challenge. And the research has shown us that at the end of that four to six year period, we should be able to assess uh, that transmission of LF has stopped. Um, so it has been shown to be an efficacious uh, uh, tool, MDA. And what we found in these two particular districts in Indonesia is that after a period of time, um, uh, multiple years of successful coverage of their mass drug administration programs, they found that when they went back and did the transmission assessment survey, actually uh, there was ongoing transmission. And so somehow there had been a failure in this approach. And you can imagine the shock and concern of the district health teams because they had done everything correctly and yet um, uh, there was still transmission. And so if we come back to that definition of IR, this was the demand driven question uh, that, that created our IR project. Why uh, was there ongoing transmission despite uh, the use of, of this efficacious tool of mass drug administration? So we pulled together the IR team and key uh, individuals on this team were members of the dist district health office themselves. So the head of the health office as well as um, the, the head of the uh, infectious disease bureaus and also um, in some areas, the health promotion um, individual was also engaged. The research team itself brought people from different disciplines together who were, who were part of the um, design of a mixed method study. And so to investigate this, uh, we looked at the approach at the community and individual level uh, and also from the deliverer. So the people who are actually bringing the treatment into the community. So what did we find? Well, there were some community related barriers to success. Some people didn't actually receive the treatments um, as they were supposed to. We found in other places that um, there was a coverage compliance gap. So those coverage numbers actually didn't re represent people who had swallowed pills, but rather people who had just received them. 
we had also we also detected that community leaders themselves were ill-informed about mass drug administration and they're often our best advocates for their own communities. We saw that there were deliverer or healthcare uh, provider related barriers. So we saw eligibility criteria that was not in accordance with uh, WHO um, criteria, new age limits and restrictions on pre-existing con conditions. We found that directly observed treatment, which was the gold standard was not actually uh, used in the field. And we also found the profile of our drug distributors was actually quite different. So if we come back to this, uh, to our, our, our effectiveness ladder here, we can see that across each of these different places, whether it's accessibility to treatment, whether it's the way that the treatment was delivered and the eligibility criteria, or actually the way that people took the pills, that there were barriers or, or uh, bottlenecks that were identified uh, by our research. So what happened? Well, we had two different districts. We had an urban area and a rural area. And so we sat together with these district health teams and we looked at the data together, we interrogated it. We actually had them sitting there with someone who was running Stata and, and we would go through and, and ask various questions of the data. And so we looked at the results together and we identified feasible uh, solutions that they could introduce to improve the next rounds of mass drug administration. And what I should note here is that the research project had no funding for an intervention. So any changes to uh, the intervention had to be borne by costs uh, by the health system itself. So in one uh, area, the urban area, no additional budget was provided. However, in the rural area, they were able to advocate to their local district parliament for additional resources. And both districts took a different approach to improve their mass drug administrations. And I've put some of those uh, up here on the slide. And in conclusion, what we saw was both districts in, in their feasible new uh, solutions uh, to these barriers saw significant changes uh, and improvements to compliance. So the people who actually took the drugs, they saw a reduction of systematic non-compliance. So people who had never taken the treatment before and they saw increases in their overall reach. So what makes implementation research different? Well, using this case study, I think we can see, first of all, the continuous monitoring cycle. The fact that the district health team was part of our research team meant that we were continuously feeding back the research to them so that any time there had to be a slight budget adjustment or a slight adjustment to a training protocol that we were able to provide insight based on the research that we were doing together. As I've highlighted, the composition of the team was, was very important here as well, to be able to draw on someone with a health promotion background, someone with an epi uh, or a stats background. Um, we had a clinician on the team. Having uh, this, this multidisciplinary team allowed us also to be more responsive um, to the needs that came from the district as well. Capacity building is embedded within IR. And, and as I explained in my example, we sat together with the district health officers to look at the data together. So they were part of this process from the very beginning. And so we brought them along in each of the different components, the, the design of the survey through to the analysis and the solution. Uh, and so their capacity building is just part of an IR project inherently. And what that does is it generates ownership. So you can imagine if a team had flown into these districts and evaluated their MDA, their master administration, and had told them all these things that were wrong, uh, it's possible that they would have taken that report and said, I'm not interested. But the fact that we worked together with them from the very beginning, those district health officers owned that problem. They owned the results and they owned the solutions. Um, and, and as a result, uh, saw success in, in later years. So in conclusion, uh, implementation research connects those dots between barriers uh, and feasible solutions. It addresses the issues that are relevant to public health challenges that we see today. We do have efficacious solutions, but they fail to produce the expected results when we introduce them into the messiness and the complexity of health systems and communities. IR builds capacity and the resilience of government programs um, and, and health care implementers as they learn themselves to identify and address barriers and bottlenecks. So I feel that and I feel strongly that a wider use of implementation research is needed to meet these health related sustainable development goals. 
and as a, a colleague and, and mentor of mine says, uh, global health is a team sport. So just acknowledging my uh, colleagues uh, in Indonesia and Australia who are part of this study. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Allison, for covering uh, what is a very broad terrain, uh, but I think you did a really nice job highlighting some of the key features of implementation science um, through the illustrative case study. Look forward to the discussion. Um, I have several questions that have already popped into my head, um, and I encourage our listeners to start thinking about their questions. So I'm going to turn things over now to Gary Aslanian, who will speak a bit more about the essence document that we've referred to. Over to you, Gary. Great. Uh, thanks, Erica. And um, great to uh, follow the footsteps of Alison, um, who gave you the background. A little bit about Essence that you may have heard of already, but just to um, reiterate its um, multi-funder nature, and it's been around since 2008 um, as a mechanism that brings together uh, various players in research uh, funding, particularly health research funding, and, and really uh, looking at um, better coordinating, harmonizing, aligning their funding, uh, identifying areas where they can work together. And, and TDR is the secretariat uh, of that initiative. So um, uh, w the way um, um, the initiative works is that it has a steering committee and for illustrative purposes, I put that there to just show you the, um, the, the diversity of the team that comes from both um, high income and middle income countries, basically wherever we have the funders because we don't uh, distinguish really uh, when it comes to the um, uh, membership. The goal is to really achieve coordination from various points. Um, and we have about uh, over the 40 different members. And in a way, there are many other initiatives uh, and ours is really unmatched in its diversity of, you know, government departments, uh, research funders, councils, research councils, or uh, philanthropic organizations or foundations. One of the things that we do, and obviously I cannot cover everything here on behalf of, of the initiative, is um, the initiative produces good practice documents and one of them is going to be presented today and um, in your spare time search for essence and uh, all of the documents are there and some of them are trilingual in um, English and French and Spanish that allows us to uh, really reach out to uh, various um, users of the documents. Uh, the document today, the seven approaches to investing in implementation research in LMICs, uh, came about uh, really the um, need, it was the fifth in the series, but it came about from the need uh, of uh, funders and some of them more involved than the others at the time in implementation research to look at that and see uh, how can they shape practices, learn from each other. And each of these documents usually goes through a year long process, uh, which in itself is a good way to bring various funders to uh, talk to each other and identify the needs and identify ways to address them through um, identifying joint uh, good practices. So while the primary audience of the document itself is um, funders, um, we also know and we have engaged with uh, those who are working in implementation research or being funded for it. And, and, and um, these documents are never done by one person. Um, several of the funder agencies like Fogarty NIH and EDCDP and uh, Swedish CEDA have been uh, closely involved. We had an expert helping us with writing and we had several consultations, et cetera. So uh, none of these documents are really possible to achieve uh, by just, just one writer. So approach one, and I'll quickly go through them. It's a bit of a disservice, obviously, to go through a whole document in seven minutes. Uh, but just to give you a sense, uh, get your appetites so you can go and search for it and look at the uh, link provided. So um, this one, this approach one is really already been mentioned. 
to engage stakeholders, to engage in consultation uh, with those that you work with who are going to be really, um, um, if there was a disconnect in implementation and how, how best to approach uh, coming up with some uh, programs that will help identify uh, these bottlenecks. And each of the uh, approaches in the document have several case studies. So in this case, there is an example from UACID funded uh, implementation science collaborative that looked at um, um, how uh, they engage stakeholders in the process of that project. And, and there are several others in the same approach. So when um, you look at the document, it is really those examples that give you uh, the detail how they've gone about doing it. Approach two uh, is um, giving some tips uh, how to embrace diversity of being an IR funding funder. And that means that you can be very opportunistic, meaning that yeah, you funders can include particular implementation research components to it. There are broader programs that are not really implementation research focused. Or you can have a strategy, and in this case, Fogarty and as well as some others in the and document show how that became a core goal uh, to support um, capacity or to support implementation research uh, capacity in LMICs. So our next approach, number three, is really um, uh, acknowledging and giving uh, some tips to funders that implementation research evolves, methodologies evolve, definitions evolve, and how to really um, use that uh, in the process and not be uh, kind of constrained by the fact that this field that we're talking about with millions of definitions, some more used than the others, is evolving. That does not mean that we need to wait for it. Uh, approach number um, four um, is to really collaborate or join collaborative processes because it's always better to do things together and it's um, um, risk um, um, reducing the risk and learning from each other. Uh, and, and we've identified some examples where funders work with each other. For example, the one um, on the Global Alliance on Chronic Disease. Um, then we had also a joint thing between TDR and EDCDP at, at, at the African regional level. And, and when this, these partnerships emerge, uh, a lot of the um, uh, lessons and, and, and strengths for various um, funders come together and, and each of them identifies areas where they are stronger and rich in terms of um, the goals that they want to reach. Number five is uh, really integrating capacity building. Uh, this is extremely important because um, uh, for some reason I went too fast and I'm not sure how to go back, uh, but here uh, is to include implementation research uh, programs, to include capacity strengthening. Um, Alison mentioned this already, and, and we um, sometimes forget that there is no research without capacity building and there is no capacity building without research or doing research. And this is very true, even more true for implementation science, especially in LMICs where, um, where the capacity is growing, but perhaps not evenly throughout uh, the countries or within countries in different areas. The sixth um, uh, approach is to really for funders to be clear, and there are some examples uh, of uh, cases, to be clear what is it expected uh, from the call or uh, what applicants should be looking for and how they should present. It's, it sounds um, may perhaps a uh, given, but in many times um, the mismatch between the calls and between the um, applications really leads to uh, perhaps not a sufficient or efficient use of time, both from those who apply and those who fund. Um, last one, and, and really this one uh, is the overarching uh, theme of this webinar when we said, uh, you know, measure seven times and cut once, which is actually in the proverb, uh, really comes back to the uh, case and, and approach 
where um, all of this enables the overall system that is being um, behind the implementation of the disease elimination or improvement of health or control of uh, infectious diseases or chronic diseases, uh, the system learns and the system learns through this research and then improves and, and, and really changes the health policies and rela related uh, political uh, environment changes that really uh, leads to a broader um, a change within the system and improvement in health. So that brings me to the end. And there is also an example here with baby friendly community initiative by um, funded uh, by USAID. So these are the seven approaches. I'll stop here and, and hand over to uh, Erica. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gary. Um, maybe you can uh, stop sharing your screen and we can come back to the panel. Thanks so much for what I know was also a challenging task to summarize a very comprehensive document and for walking us through some of the key steps. Um, so now I'm going to invite um, our panel of funders to comment briefly. Um, so Montasser, can I start with you? Sure, thank you so much, um, um, Alison and Gary, for this very helpful uh, presentation uh, on this very important topic um, for us as well. Uh, and we're really glad to be, of course, uh, associated and members of uh, Essence and, and to have supported the production of this document. Um, you know, IDRC has always supported the diverse and multi-sectoral uh, portfolio and areas of research and develop for development. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, aligning with all of this work for the achievement of the SDGs. Um, and for that, implementation research is at the heart of what we do, and it is uh, very much um, um, sort of uh, uh, quite a majority of uh, research who support is, uh, is uh, characterized as implementation research. We have the unique advantage is that our mandate is to invest in, uh, in researchers and partnerships that support development of low and middle income countries. Um, and within this mandate, we have, a, you know, the fr framing and the new strategy of strengthening health and our, our new strategy, strengthening health systems um, to deliver on the um, um, SDG goals uh, three, and also of course five for uh, uh, on gender equality. And, and for that sort of prioritizing, removing the barriers, the systemic barriers, for populations uh, that are usually left behind, especially in terms of their health uh, status. Um, our approach is, is partnerships, which are, I think, really a point that we want to emphasize as a very important for implementation research um, and emphasizing uh, within that then the quality of data and information systems to be as rigorous as any other kind of research for, in order to inform uh, policies and uh, for decision makers uh, on the basis of the findings. Um, we, our strategy is, is based on a commit to, uh, the commitment to support generating practical solutions. And Alison, you may raise that, so I think that's really great, uh, to improve access to quality health services. And our global health work focuses on uh, implementation research and see, to see and study how interventions work in real world um, settings and real situations. Um, we, we really emphasize approaches in implementation research to bring teams together, research teams together, uh, and to have that um, the research teams grounded in communities with those working at different levels of the health system, ensuring that local realities inform and are informed by regional and uh, global initiatives. These collaborative efforts help to strengthen the relationship needed to drive sustainable change and to build programs to respond to these uh, to, to local problems and local and local contexts. Um, strengthening health systems research requires a long-term effort, though, and implementation research is not a quick. Uh, uh, it's not about quick fixes, but it's about effective uh, effective um, removal of barriers and improving access, and that sometimes uh, takes time. For, for improved and sustained capacity for research are key to this, and policy development and implementation are, are, are must be integral to this part of the uh, of research as well as we have heard from uh, both Alison and Gary, and this is why we believe partnerships among donor organizations is key 
to leverage their expertise and resources for a better good. The implementation is not um, uh, only a focus of one type of donor organizations, but should be really uh, of all don uh, focus of all donor organizations. Uh, beyond coming together to share experiences and guidance, guidance as shown in the document shared by Gary, research funding organizations are also jointly uh, coming together to support implementation research, allowing them to go above and beyond what they uh, would uh, be able to have achieved on their own. Um, and we have that was demonstrated very well in our um, the partnership we have with Canadian Institutes for Health Research and Global Affairs Canada in innovating for maternal and child health in Africa initiative, um, MCHA. Um, the interventions that were tested in that in partnership and initiative were uh, in real world uh, in real world uh, settings to improve maternal and child health. More recently, we have an, another partnership also with Global Affairs Canada supporting youth uh, uh, partnerships between youth organizations and the research community to conduct implementation research to improve adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, in Senegal and uh, combat the sexual and gender-based violence. To succeed um, in supporting implementation research and uh, uh, projects in uh, LMICs, there are many considerations, but the main one for us is about strengthening capacity and accompaniment. What this means is that composition of teams that need to be multidisciplinary, providing needed technical and supporting provision of technical assistance, the support of co-creation approach with the involvement of the beneficiaries, the communities who are the subject, but also participants in the project defining the issues to be, um, to be studied. And finally, providing the space for teams to regularly interact, share and learn from each other for increasing synergies and greater impact and that is the, uh, the success that we're all looking for um, and really glad to be here today to speak about this. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Montasser. And again, congratulations on uh, IDRC's launch of their 10-year strategy. We posted it in the chat in case anyone wants to have a look. It was just launched yesterday. <clears throat> and I'm hearing some recurring themes around capacity building. So not just the generation of knowledge from implementation science, but also capacity for using that knowledge. Um, I'm going to turn things now to Jennifer Gunning from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Always a great pleasure to reconnect with you, Jennifer. Um, so for a few remarks, and then we'll invite Rachel next. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Erica. Um, and thank you for hosting um, and organizing this webinar, Erica, um, and to Allison and Gary for their presentations. Um, I'm personally um, very pleased to be here, and I know CITR overall is really happy to participate in this event and to provide a few reflections in terms of the importance of implementation research as well as international connections for our organization. Um, first, I'd like to just start by highlighting um, the fact that uh, particularly in the context of CITR's investments in global health research, implementation science really does have significant prominence. Um, very much under the leadership of Erica and one of our, her, our former scientific directors, uh, Nancy Edwards, um, CITR has had a lot of focus on implementation science in its global health work. And the large majority of our strategic or targeted programs in global health have had a very deliberate focus on implementation science, really as an effort to, as a research funder, to do what we can to help um, bridge that gap between knowing and doing, and in recognition of the importance of having really context-specific information to take those interventions that are tested at the pilot stage and really take them into implementation at scale. Um, just a, a small aside to signal, though, uh, implementation research is not uh, limited to our global health investments by any means. There's a number of our programs that are more focused on domestic health issues, have quite a strong implementation science focus as well. Um, secondly, just with respect to the Essence Good Practice document on investing on implementation research, um, just to say that this document and really all seven of its identified approaches really resonate strongly with uh, CIHR and are considered uh, to be critical elements of good implementation science or implementation research in our perspective. Um, just a couple of things to signal in, per, um, in particular. There are a number of the approaches that really we do try to embed very deliberately into our research funding programs or funding opportunities. 
Um, I will say that there's been an evolution over the years in terms of how we do this, recognizing that we as a research funder are learning about this field along with the research community. But a couple of the approaches in particular that are really embedded into our implementation science programs very strongly uh, are approach number one around the inclusion of very diverse stakeholders from the earliest stages of the research process and right through to its implementation and, and knowledge dissemination, uh, as well as approach number five, which has been mentioned already in terms of the integration of training and mentoring and fellowships uh, into, an, into implementation research is uh, a strong commitment by CIHR as well. Um, the other approach that I'll just um, reflect on very briefly is approach number four and the importance of international partnerships. Uh, that is certainly reflected in terms of CIHR's priorities and activities. Uh, Essence is one uh, very good example of that. Uh, as an organization, we've certainly uh, very much benefited from the opportunity to have discussions with like-minded organizations on our approaches and practices to supporting global health research and implementation science in particular. And that engagement has been quite influential in terms of influencing our thinking in this regard. And then the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases, which has been mentioned already, is also a, a very strong uh, signal of CIHR's ongoing commitment to international cooperation in this space and implementation research in particular. Um, CIHR is a founding member of the GACD. As an alliance of global health research funders, it's really, um, I think over the last 10 years or so, has had a significant impact in terms of advancing the field of implementation research, uh, increasing our collective investments in the field, building capacity, and really creating some invaluable global implementation research networks. And there's some really good tools and resources on the GACD website now and moving forward as well. And so if you're not familiar with that alliance already, I'd really encourage you um, to just look into that a little bit more. And then just lastly, in terms of the place for implementation research within CIHR moving forward, um, unlike IDRC, we haven't quite launched our new strategic plan yet, um, but we will be doing so um, before the end of this month. Um, and later this year, we will be launching a new framework for action on global health research as well, which has been in development um, for a couple of years now. So we're really um, excited about these uh, foundational documents coming forward um, over the coming weeks and months. Um, I'd really encourage you to go back to the CIHR website to review those documents, because I think they will really uh, provide some good insights in terms of the role for implementation science uh, moving forward at CIHR. And I just realized I'm so sorry by accident, I had closed the, um, the slide for my video and I didn't realize that you couldn't That's see okay. me. That's okay, don't worry about it. We just thought maybe you were not going to hedge your bets with internet issues. <laughs> so, so no, I, I had turned on my- to happen, don't worry. Um, anyway, so sorry. So much. That's totally fine. Thanks so much, Jennifer, for your remarks and kind remarks about my previous role. Rachel, um, I'll turn things over to you. And then we've got a number of questions that have been coming in. So I'm going to take them in sort of bundles, but we will also commit to everyone to respond to your questions. So uh, just bear with us. So Rachel, um, last but not least, <laughs> sorry, but come uh, it, uh, over to you. No problem. And apologies in advance. Um, for noise here. I have small people running around, but um, hopefully they won't bother us too much. But um, just to say that given enduring gaps in translation of evidence into policy and programs, Fogarty and the NIH more broadly is increasingly supporting research and research training and implementation science across all of its programs. Um, Fogarty has had implementation science in its strategic plan since 2008 but traction um, for implementation science as a sort of conventional, well-respected science at NIH has been slow, um, but certainly there is increasing investment. Um, Fogarty also continues to work with other NIH institutes and centers that are supporting research and implementation science to help ensure um, that broader NIH efforts um, integrate a global perspective and provide pathways for lessons learned abroad to be applied to public health challenges in the U.S. Um, Fogarty um, comes to the field emphasizing the importance of capacity building, which has come up in the previous remarks. Um, that is sort of our bread and butter at NIH. 
um, and including the importance of mentors, um, an important gap um, that we've seen and heard about in LMICs where most countries lack a critical mass of researchers trained in implementation science. Um, so we're constantly finding ways to support um, long-term but also short course training local implementation science networks that facilitate mentorship and capacity building in general in LMICs for implementation science. Um, NIH and Fogarty also recognize implementation science as an interdisciplinary field and so therefore we encourage teams that span across the health spectrum but also include um, psychology, economic and public health perspectives. Um, again, this has also been mentioned. Um, another um, important point that in addition to building capacity and fu um, funding and supporting the science, Fogarty and I think increasingly at NIH, um, we're making efforts to focus on finding innovative ways to catalyze interaction between um, researchers, researchers who are funded at implementation science, but um, along with policymakers and program implementers, really to promote uptake of evidence into global health policies and practice. So we've said um, it's sort of increasingly understood that support for implementation research alone will have limited impact unless you, you pair it with this facilitated um, and deliberate um, effort to uh, force the interaction between researchers and program implementers um, and policymakers. Um, so building on its investments, um, Fogarty and then increasingly at NIH, we've continued to explore innovative strategies to ca catalyze effective interactions between these stakeholders um, in an effort to maximize public health outcomes and the return on research investments. Um, and the, the idea is that enhanced communication and collaboration between these communities can help facilitate better translation of evidence into policy and programs while sim simultaneously helping to ensure that research is country driven and responsive to the local context. Um, and I'll make one more point about um, partnerships in this area as well. We um, find that within the space of implementation science, those partnerships are really important um, and are also um, actively engaged in the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases as well, um, importantly in their capacity building efforts in their implementation science school. Um, so I will stop there. Um, that's great. Thanks so much, Rachel. And maybe I can invite all the speakers to come on camera if you're able to. So um, perhaps I'm going to start with Allison. So we've had a couple of questions really about the theory and practice with implementation science. So maybe if I could just invite everyone to keep your responses brief, because I'd like to get through as many questions as possible, but we commit to everyone to send uh, you any follow up um, answers that you may have. So Allison, I thought maybe I, I would start with you. Um, around talking about what are the, I mean, a field doesn't, you know, land in a vacuum. And so we have operations research, translational research, knowledge translation, et cetera. So in your, you know, maybe in a nutshell, what do you think are some of the key distinguishing features of IR compared to operational research and translational research? This is a, you gave me the easy question. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's a loaded <laughs> question and I know everybody can so, write in, but. <laughs> I actually just, uh, I actually just posted a nice paper uh, uh, on in a, a response to that question um, from Hans Rem, which might be a useful resource. He kind of breaks down the different uh, kinds of research. I think the main thing, just really quickly with implementation research that makes it so different is where does the question come from? It mm -hmm. comes out of the health system. It's not the scientist or the researcher that comes in and says, I think you have a problem. It's the health system that produces this, this uh, the question that drives the research. And I think also it's their inherent engagement and involvement in the process. So that, that makes it a little bit different um, just in terms of its makeup uh, to, to some of the other um, uh, research approaches. And I think I won't go on more, but I think if uh, everyone can have a look at that paper, uh, there's a really nice definition of the differences and also the scope of the research in terms of how broad uh, the, the, the different research approaches are. Thank so. you, Allison. And, and if I may just add that I know most of the examples you were giving were within the health system, but implementation science actually applies um, to systems outside of health. And so, um, but the principle still holds, right? That, you know, we can't just supply the research. There needs to be a demand and those questions need to come from the systems, whether they're social, economic or other systems, including health. Um, there is a question that I'll sort of throw out to any funder who might want to, uh, 
take the question, and that is, what are some of the unique challenges of funders of implementation research in reviewing or evaluating proposals and recommendations? Um, so who would like to take that one on? Rachel, thank you. I can start um, just to say, it, I think at NIH, the challenges, um, there are a couple of different challenges. Um, I think certainly, um, educating our review panels about the rigor and methodologies of implementation science has been um, important. Um, I think when a sort of traditional study sits alongside an implementation science study, often the implementation science study might not get um, rated as highly if they're the, the review panel is not educated. I think with respect to um, global implementation science, um, we have found that the sort of LMICPIs um, don't compete as well next to the USPIs. So sort of trying to find opportunities to fund low and middle income country researchers um, has been challenging. And that's true, I think, both with research proposals, but also in some of the more competitive trainings that we sponsor. Um, again, oftentimes the LMIC um, applicants aren't, aren't um, competing as, as strongly. So we are constantly trying to find ways to sort of elevate the global implementation science work and, and opportunities. That's great. Um, so actually, um, one other question that uh, has come in relates to, and it's been a recurring theme in all your presentations around capacity building and whose capacity we're building. So obviously on the research side, we're talking about trainees, postdocs creating, career paths for people who do implementation science. But then there is an argument to be made around sort of the practice side, the policy and practice uh, side so that there are there's receptor capacity there. So Gary, any thoughts on the receptor capacity side? And then maybe I'll come back to Jennifer or Montaster to maybe comment from a research funder perspective on the other side of the coin. Gary? Right. Um, sure. Very quickly, um, it's obviously the other end of the the knowledge being produced and, and it has been an issue that um, it's not just the result of implementation research that you need, but you also need to actually integrate it. Some of the approaches um, used by some funders also include a stage where um, uh, the um, translation of the results um, and then you really have to do that in, in throughout the system, throughout the process, but that became a real um, clear that without this, um, it, 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 that is important part of that um, chain. So in many of the examples we looked at that um, uh, in the process of it, many funders try to do that. Uh, obviously there's a mismatch of timing uh, between when the results are needed today because tomorrow they need to change something and research takes 12 months uh, the best mm -hmm. uh, and the fastest uh, so the uh, the balance between those things uh, is always uh, important to match the timing and match expectations from both sides okay that's great um any thoughts from jennifer montasser sort of on sort of the pipeline of researchers um that whose capacity we also need to build in this relatively new science. Uh, any thoughts? So just a couple of things very quickly. So certainly, as I mentioned, capacity building is a critical element of all of our global health and our implementation research programs. Um, that capacity there would be an expectation to build that capacity, both within our Canadian research ecosystem, certainly emphasis in building research capacity in low and middle income settings, and definitely recognition about that capacity required on the receptor side of things as, as well. I would say certainly, the investments as research funders have been primarily targeted to the research sector, but I think increasing recognition about the need for capacity in the other sectors as well. Um, around the GACD table in particular, there's certainly been recognition of this, thinking about what as an alliance of implementation science funders can be done to build our toolkit um, uh, in terms of implement implementation research capacity. As I mentioned, there will be some uh, virtual tools coming available on the JACD website. Um, I think the JACD is on the call. They may want to add something in the chat, but I think those tools will not only be available and uh, relevant for the research community, but also for the receptor community as well. And it will be incumbent upon us as 
a community of research funders to make sure that um, the policy folks, the, the folks on the ground are accessing these tools um, as well as our, our trainees. Great, Montasser, maybe I can ask you a separate question um, just and we'll stop there, but we commit to uh, sending you um, answers to the various questions that have come in. So rest assured and apologies, we couldn't get to all of them. But I think just in light of the recent launch of your strategic plan, um, there's a question here, which I think really speaks back to the SDGs, which was the focus of this. So given the intersections between health and many other development challenges like climate change, inequalities, what needs to be in place for implementation research to help address this complexity, particularly in the context of the SDGs and leaving no one behind? So any thoughts about um, how IDRC is thinking about it or what you think about that? Thanks so much, uh, Erica. Um, um, yeah, I think this is where um, kind of like the rubber hits the road, um, sort of translating the, the intersectionality and the interconnectedness of the social determinants to really to the people's population health. Um, I'll just give one example. We just launched um, a, a call from IDRC, a call, we call it a One Health call, and that is precisely for research on the intersection or the interface between animal health, environmental health, and human health. I think the more opportunities as funders uh, that we put out there for uh, researchers to think together, to think about in an intersectional and in an integrated way, the more possible it will be to generate um, uh, knowledge and new science on the basis of implementation research methodologies or any other research methodology to really make it uh, easy for the researchers and attractive for the researchers to think of uh, questions and issues in a complex way and not in a singular way. Of course, there is a there is room for you know narrowing down, but there is now as we see real world problems, there is just a need for more integrated research approaches and to also make the research less extractive, right? You know, so to make it more um, engaging, inclusive, to really come up with real um, uh, uh, solutions for for what we see as as persistent problems. That's great. Thanks so much. I wish we could. Um, I know there are a number of other questions we didn't get to, but as I said, we commit to uh, following up by email with some responses. And so just on behalf of um, all the panelists um, and all the um, questions, thank you so much for tuning in today. Special thanks for um, to Gary, you know, the quintessential convener. Um, and uh, he brought us all together today. And I think we could certainly have a follow-up call to this um, to discuss many of the issues that we were starting to unpack. So thanks to all of you for your participation and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoons or evenings. Thank you.